burning down a real forest, vegan leather, and losing Mel Gibson, there's so much more to Gladiator than we all ever knew. Any idea for a film, no matter how great, usually has to be conveyed in words through the screenplay before the on-the-ground work can begin. The genesis of Gladiator was a little different. Ridley Scott explained to Variety that his directing is very, quote, visually driven. In fact, he was so inspired by a 19th century painting that producer Walter Park showed him that he immediately signed up to direct Gladiator without seeing a script. According to Scott, a Jean-Léon Jérôme painting featuring a gladiator standing tall over his vanquished opponent was enough to convince him that Gladiator was a movie worth making. Scott explained, When you're experienced, like me, you can do a little knee-jerk flash decision, and normally it's accurate. So I said, I'll do it. Park said, Hang on, you don't know what the story's about. I said, I don't care, I'll do it. And that was it. Russell Crowe mesmerized audiences with the brooding intensity, righteous wrath, principled demeanor, and flair for violence that best embodies Maximus. But five years earlier, Mel Gibson was doing a similar thing in the guise of William Wallace in Braveheart. Both Gladiator and the movie about the wronged Scott who took on the might of the English army proved a similar fact. There was still a massive market for movies with swords, stirring speeches, black-hearted villains, and lone heroes facing overwhelming odds. A year after Gladiator, the Lord of the Rings franchise would unmistakably hammer this point home. According to the New York Times, Gibson was originally offered the role which made Crow famous. The mixture of sensitive soul and vengeful psychopath that Gibson brought to bear on the role of Wallace would have probably worked equally as well for Maximus. Both characters have all they hold dear wiped out by the callous whims of egotistical tyrants who represent a cruel and corrupt regime. Wallace and Maximus also both have a strict sense of right and wrong, even when they're busy decapitating and disemboweling their fellow men. We Got This Covered reports that Gibson passed on the role of Maximus to play Benjamin Martin in The Patriot a movie whose mix of sentimentality and sadism failed to strike the delicate balance needed to give it wings. Gladiator, on the other hand, soared like a phoenix. As the ancient world's biggest amphitheater and an arena where matters of life and death were decided daily, Rome's Colosseum has left a huge imprint on history. It also left something of a significant bloodstain. The Colosseum is the perfect symbol of humanity's dual urge to create and destroy. With seating that catered to an audience of 50,000 strong, the Colosseum was bringing rock and roll to the masses centuries before Elvis Presley or the Beatles. Today, recreating the imposing and majestic architecture of such a structure would be a simple case of calling the CGI specialists in. But back in 2000, they preferred to opt for a combination of both technology and legwork. The Guardian reports that Scott was thrilled to be afforded the chance to bring ancient Rome to life and wanted to keep the vibe on set as real as possible. Heading to a vacant parade ground in Malta, Scott set about recreating the sprawl, sense, and space of Rome on land miles removed from the Eternal City. Anyone who's seen Gladiator will testify to the glory of the set, but it's the Colosseum that steals the show. Standing at 16 meters tall, its first tier was built by hand and the remaining two tiers were were a smoke and mirrors product of the CGI department. The same method was applied to its circumference and the baying crowds. Yet the effect is flawless, seamless, and as close to Imperial Rome as we're ever likely to get. In this environmentally aware age, burning down a forest just to give a battle scene added authenticity would seem a step too far. Yet with a budget of over $100 million and a film to shoot that needed to grip the viewer's attention from the get-go, Ridley Scott needed to go big. Fortunately for the director, a large area of the forest in Surrey, England, where the opening scene in Gladiator is filmed, was scheduled for deforestation prior to filming. The Sun reports that when Scott got wind of the forthcoming cull, he contracted the Forestry Commission and offered to kill two birds with one stone. The authorities got someone to maintain Bornwood free of charge, and Scott got the heat and fury of a bona fide battle in the heart of Germania. At its heart, Gladiator is a simple revenge story. The cruel and overprivileged lord of the manor ruins a good and noble man's life out of pure spite and toxic envy, and the hero vows to right this wrong by wading knee-deep in a torrent of carnage and blood. Gladiator is the sort of epic and emotive movie that doesn't need an intricate plot to make it work. However, it was heavily influenced by a book that screenwriter David Franzoni stumbled across by chance in Baghdad when he was a young college graduate in the 1970s. Film School Rejects reports that Daniel 
Daniel P. Mannix's Those About to Die, aka The Way of the Gladiator, left a big mark on Franzoni, who was enthralled by tales of those who fought and died in the Roman games. The factual book is a no-holds-barred account of the true depravity and slaughter that took place in Roman arenas in the name of entertainment. Franzoni decided it could provide the raw materials of a great movie. In the final product, historical facts were approached with a certain liberty, and the Roman Empire was given a modern makeover to make the gladiatorial games look more relevant to our age of huge sporting events. But the essence of the gory and disturbing details Franzoni found in Mannix's book remained. Gladiator gave the vicarious generation of a new millennium a raw and bloody taste of how the ancients used to get their rocks off. As well as being prodigal talents, the late Oliver Reed and Richard Harris also had a reputation for being committed and uncompromising. With his star on the rise at the time, Russell Crowe also had a similar no-nonsense, head-down approach to the art of acting and life. Putting all three prickly thespians on the set of an alpha male type movie such as Gladiator was always going to be a combustible situation. According to a piece in The Sun, Harris, who plays Marcus Aurelius, announced on day two of filming, I've read that I am in a movie starring Oliver Reed. Can I make one thing clear? I would never be caught dead in a movie starring Oliver Reed. Are we understood? As for Reed, when not busy playing gladiator trainer Proximo, he was busy drinking heavily, arm wrestling with sailors, and getting banned from hotel bars. As for Russell Crowe, well, it's safe to say Ridley Scott had his hands full. Recalling his time on the set, Garth Pierce wrote in The Sun that Crowe did a lot of moaning about the script, the weather, and the boredom. Ridley Scott finally exploded and snarled, he thinks he can pull that sh with me? I'll go back to Hollywood and bury him." Scott would later add, he had to learn there was only one person in charge, and that was the director. On the eve before Oliver Reed died of a fatal heart attack, The Sun reports the hard-living 61-year-old had downed a phenomenal amount of alcohol. The next morning was another non-filming day, and he returned to his favorite local pub early on in the day. Later, his pallor was worrisome, and his wife called an ambulance. However, it was too late, as Reed died before he could finish filming his last scene for Gladiator. Crew member Rob Harris explained that when filming recommenced, we all waited for words from Ridley Scott, which never came. It was the case of Into the Valley of Death, Forward March. Although Reed has a relatively small role in Gladiator as the slave dealer who owns Maximus, it is an integral one. In the wake of Reed's death, Scott was faced with the problem of how to seamlessly finish the film and honor Reed's memory. The answer came, as it so often does, in the shape of technology. Scott explained to Variety, We managed to finish off what was required from Oliver, stealing digital images of his face and attaching them to an appropriate body. Although an easy task by today's standards, at the turn of the century, such cinematic trickery was completely novel. It was expensive, too, to the tune of $3.2 million spent for just two minutes of screen time featuring the image of Reed from Beyond the Grave. Russell Crowe explained to Variety that he never liked the original script for Gladiator, yet the opportunity to work with Ridley Scott was too good an opportunity to miss. Screenwriter David Franzoni revealed that he and Scott were determined to steer well clear of the classic sword and sandal movies and used foreign cinema as their blueprint. He was also open to cast members, suggesting various ideas for major rewrites during pre-production and throughout the entire shoot. Scott, Franzoni, and Crowe often met during filming to discuss how the script could be given an extra charge of energy, and new dialogue was often written on the hoof. Franzoni explained, We'd all drink whiskey and smoke cigars. We'd exchange notes and ideas. Then I'd go back and write at three or four in the morning, and I'd hand the pages to Ridley. During the shoot, I went off and met with Russell. We would meet almost daily before he would go shoot and talk about the scenes. I remember once we were sitting on the ground, drawing things in the sand. It was a very 60s way to make a film. Crow added jokingly, I've often said to Ridley since, one of these days, we should actually do a film where we know what we're going to do before we start. Although Maximus and Emperor Commodus are arch enemies in the film, off screen, Russell Crowe and Joaquin Phoenix became the best of buddies. Following his brother River Phoenix's death, Gladiator was one of the first big productions that Joaquin appeared in. Crowe explained to Variety that during the publicity rounds for Gladiator, a lot of journalists would bombard Phoenix. They'd ask him questions about his brother because Maximus and Commodus initially share a brotherly bond in the film. Prodding Phoenix about how he felt about his co-star, Crowe explained, At one point, we were doing some press conference and Phoenix just said something along the lines of, look, Russell treated me like a brother, and it just hit me in a really heavy way. 
Cinema.com reports that Crow also revealed he helped Phoenix overcome his nerves on the set of Gladiator by sharing a few key libations. Crow explained that it was Richard Harris who suggested all three actors sit down together, have a drink, and discuss what was bothering Phoenix. Crow added, We talked about how Phoenix requires an external force to get him into the moment, and through a number of hours and a number of cans of Guinness, I got the point across to him that it's actually an internal journey, and everything he needs to do with the character lives within him. An actor's life isn't all about mass adulation, award ceremonies, talk shows, and meet and greet events on the red carpet. In Russell Crowe's case, playing an alpha male such as Maximus in Gladiator actually left him black, blue, bloodied, and bruised, as well as smashing up his hip and breaking a foot bone during his time as a sword and shield man. Crowe also had a close call with one of the tigers, but fortunately lived to tell the tale. In an interview with WENN, Crowe revealed the days of doing his own stunts are long behind him because his body is no longer capable of bouncing back in the same way anymore. Listing the injuries he had picked up on set, Crow said, I've got no cartilage in my toes anymore, I've got grade 4 tears in both Achilles tendons, I've got shin splints, I've got bone marrow edemas under both knees, I've got one disintegrating hip, I've got a rib in my upper thoracic that pops off my spine. This stuff comes from committing to the job and giving myself over to the job. After killing Emperor Commodus and finally avenging the murders of his wife, child, and surrogate father, Maximus gives in to the ravages and wounds inflicted upon his body and dies so that justice might live. It's an emotive and fitting ending to Gladiator, and it's difficult to see how Maximus could have survived without lessening the film's impact. However, although the death of Maximus seems inevitable in the film's original screenplay, Maximus would have lived. This seems vastly at odds with the character whose only motivation and ambition in life is to kill Commodus, rid Rome of corruption, and reunite with his family in the afterlife. Maximus has no appetite for life, but he has an insatiable thirst for vengeance, and once that's quenched, it's difficult to imagine him starting over on some rural small holding somewhere. It was a concern held by both Ridley Scott and Russell Crowe, who told Empire that my name is Maximus speech is basically a suicide note. I remember Ridley coming up to me on set saying, look, the way this is shaping up, I don't see how you live. The character is about one act of pure vengeance for his wife and child, and once he's accomplished that, what does he do? Crow revealed he had a long-running joke that, in an alternate universe, the world-weary and battle-hardened warrior could have ended up running a pizza joint near the Colosseum. Fortunately, everybody reached an agreement that fate was firmly fixed for Maximus, and it didn't involve pepperoni. Although they enjoyed a fierce reputation as a nation-state built on blood and conquest, being a vegetarian or a vegan in ancient Rome was not as unusual as you might think. According to Encyclopedia Britannica, many ancient Greco-Romans were keen proponents of the plant and mineral diet. In Rome, only the rich could afford to tear into animal flesh regularly, but because polyester and spandex weren't a thing back then, your average Roman would have had to wear wool or leather. This posed a tricky dilemma for long-term vegan Joaquin Phoenix when it came to playing the bloodthirsty Emperor Commodus. As a merciless dictator and vengeful tyrant, Commodus has no qualms about butchering everything and anything if it offends his sensibilities. Obviously, wearing the skin of a dead animal is not going to be a bone of contention for such a man. Yet, according to ABC News, so fierce are Phoenix's vegan principles, he refused to wear leather when playing the Roman overlord, and the costume department had to kit him out with a synthetic substitute. PETA reports that Phoenix, who has made the same stance on his wardrobe when playing characters in other films such as the Johnny Cash biopic Walk the Line explained, My lifestyle is part of who I am and therefore is always a consideration when working. I always discuss this with producers and they are very accommodating. Despite being a concise, self-contained, and satisfying story, which leaves no stone unturned or loose end to clutch onto for over 20 years, there have been varying levels of demand for either a sequel or prequel to Gladiator. Perhaps keen to have another taste of the intoxicating commercial and critical success, both Ridley Scott and Russell Crowe have at some point given the idea some serious thought. According to Deadline, Paramount confirmed Ridley Scott would be directing the decades later sequel to Gladiator. It's set to feature Paul Meskel as Lucius from the original movie, who's now all grown up years after Maximus' death. 
You may remember that Lucius was the young nephew of Joaquin Phoenix's Emperor Commodus. Will Lucius be the new champion of the Colosseum? We'll have to wait and see until Gladiator 2 hits theaters on November 22, 2024.